Thanks very much. And it's a real pleasure to be here at COGX. There are so many different topics that are associated with artificial intelligence. It's very interesting for us to discuss this particular one in the context of ethics, because when we're talking about deep fakes and disinformation, we're by definition dealing with folks that have abandoned ethics, and they're intentionally trying to deceive others by creating fraud. So this is a problem that I have dealt with in various ways throughout my career. I was previously responsible for click fraud protection at Google, where cyber criminal groups starting in the mid-2000s would create large-scale fraud uh, simulating human activity in order to be able to generate money for themselves. And now at Shape, one of the things that we do is we protect against large-scale simulations of humans that are trying to take over bank accounts, take over airline accounts, and basically attack every user interface that exists online. So when we're talking about the ethics of these cyber criminal groups, these are organizations that don't care at all about being responsible in their use of artificial intelligence. They don't care at all about the effects that they're having on others. And they do things that are absolutely unconscionable. Like, for example, inserting Nicolas Cage into various movies that you might have seen all over the internet. So this is a pretty benign example of what you can do with deep fake technology and what you can do with artificial intelligence in general for your own amusement. But there are more nefarious uses of this that I'm sure many of you have already seen. For example, this video from Jordan Peele demonstrating how you can use deep fake technology to get President Obama to say just about whatever you want if you're simulating his voice. Now, there's another video that has been in the news cycle recently, which is not a deep fake. And so this video of Nancy Pelosi does not require any real sophistication to be able to create. It's just slowing down an image in the same way that you could slow down a video 40 years ago. But it has a very similar type of effect in terms of making people believe something that simply isn't the case. So when we're talking about disinformation and related topics, I find that it's useful to have some kind of framework to be able to provide uh, what uh, education professionals call pedagogical scaffolding in order to be able to have a productive discussion. So here is a framework that actually comes from First Draft, which is a project uh, spun out of Harvard's Kennedy School. And it demonstrates how there's a difference between misinformation, malinformation, and disinformation. So misinformation is something that we have seen a great deal of in terms of any time people make a mistake. Uh, it's not necessarily intentional, but it's giving us information that is inaccurate. Malinformation, on the other hand, is information which is accurate, but it is being distributed or it's being published specifically with the intent to create harm. So for example, taking people's private information and doxing them in order to be able to publish it online to be able to uh, make people think differently about them or to be able to hurt them in some way because of the disclosure of that private information, that's an example of malinformation. Disinformation, on the other hand, is information which is both inaccurate and has been created in order to uh, perpetuate fraud and create harm. And so that's what we're going to be discussing today. So how do we identify disinformation? One of the most natural things that we do is we ask ourselves, does this look suspicious? Is this coming from a source that we actually trust? And upon performing further research, can we actually demonstrate or prove that it's real? So there are various sources that society has a great deal of trust in these days. And the encyclopedia wars are over. And Wikipedia has won. Uh, this is actually a headline from more than 10 years ago based on a study that was conducted in Nature uh, where they concluded in a comparison between Wikipedia articles and Encyclopedia Britannica articles that Wikipedia was just as valid and just as accurate as Encyclopedia Britannica was. So just um, let's delve into an example of a uh, Wikipedia article. Uh, show of hands, how many folks have heard of the uh, author Emerson LaSalle from the United States? So those of you who raised your hands, you have some questions you need to ask yourselves because this is not a real author. <laughs> this is a fake article that lasted on Wikipedia for more than a year. 
you can see that there was a great deal of work that was put into this article, coming up with fake names of novels that he'd written, like Men Called Him Trevor. And <laughs> when you think of the review process that goes into Wikipedia articles, these are real human editors. This is not technology being fooled. This is human editors looking at this article and saying, yeah, this looks okay to me. Here is an article that lasted on Wikipedia for more than 11 years. This is about a civil war general who never existed, complete with a monument that has nothing to do with this fictional civil war general. So what if we could do a much better job of this, not only on Wikipedia, but on various other news sources and channels? What if we could identify all fake content much faster than one year or after 11 years? What if we could do it, for example, within 30 days? Well, there's a famous quote that you guys might be familiar with from Winston Churchill that a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to get its pants on. And what this is illustrating is that once you discover that something actually is disinformation, sometimes the harm has already been caused. It's too late. It makes people think of something that they weren't thinking of before. Maybe they start asking themselves, yeah, you know what? Nancy Pelosi is getting a bit old. Even though I know that that video is doctored and she did not speak in the way that the video made it appear that she speaked, now I'm thinking about something that I wasn't thinking about before. And so it's really difficult to be able to diffuse that harm and prevent it from occurring unless you can get really fast at being able to identify that disinformation, hopefully getting to the point of being able to prevent it from getting out there or getting propagated uh, uh, very early on in that cycle. Now, by the way, this quote from Winston Churchill is also interesting because Winston Churchill never actually said this. <laughs> but society really believes that he did. If you do a Google search on it, you can find more than 30,000 web pages that show that Winston Churchill actually said that thing. So you'll find folks that will definitely disagree and say, no, no, I'm absolutely certain that he said that. So disinformation is something that is very difficult to fight against. So how is fake content actually created? So when we're talking about deep fakes, there are a number of different applications. Some of them are available for download. Fake app is probably the most popular. So this is the user interface. You can string together some NVIDIA GPUs, and you yourself can insert Nicolas Cage into whatever videos you would like. There's also technology that's available. This is from a website called thispersondoesnotexist.com from Philip Wang, who's a software engineer at Uber. And none of these people actually exist. These are simulated faces created using uh, NVIDIA's uh, StyleGAN toolkit. There is also deep learning and uh, uh, AI technology that allows you to be able to completely simulate voices of celebrities such as prominent politicians. Once you've synthesized those voices, there is additional technology that allows you to be able to match the movement of their lips in videos to that audio that you've created. And this is an article from just yesterday that talks about new research that's coming out of Stanford and the Max Planck Institute, Princeton, and Adobe that allows you to basically fix up all of the minor errors that in get introduced in the deep fake generation process today. So there's this stack of technology that exists to make it easy for even folks that don't have a great deal of technical knowledge to be able to create very realistic videos. So if you can generate those videos, now one of the questions that you might have is, what should I have those videos say? Let's say that I have a political agenda, or let's say that I have the desire to be able to generate fake content on a particular topic. It might be a lot of work for me to sit there and write out the script that I want these celebrities or politicians to say. So now there's AI that does that for you as well. Some of this AI has already been flagged as being so problematic that there are organizations such as uh, Elon Musk's OpenAI organization that has refused to reveal or share its technology because they believe it has a great potential for harm. So how do we actually protect ourselves against this type of disinformation? Like I was mentioning, we need to try and detect this content 
as it's being propagated. It's not actually possible to prevent it from being created in the first place. You can't control what someone can do on their own workstation in a basement or what a uh, cyber criminal organization halfway around the world might be generating. But as soon as it gets shared onto a social media platform, as soon as it gets posted onto a website, that's where the public has the opportunity and online services perhaps have a responsibility to actually detect it and do something about it. And so there was an article written by Andy Greenberg in Wired a few months ago talking about how we need to go beyond security as an industry and we need to deal with how online applications and platforms can be abused. So something can be completely secure from a traditional cybersecurity perspective, but if it can be abused, then you can create all kinds of unintended consequences. So some of you might be familiar with Uba Butler who was a journalist at Vice, who was able to make his shed the number one restaurant on TripAdvisor by creating fake reviews. So that's an example of a system where it wasn't a data breach, it wasn't a traditional cybersecurity vulnerability they had exploited, but just by creating fake reviews, he was able to manipulate not only what the system was saying, but also the public opinion about an entity somewhere out there in the world. So how widespread is this type of automated abuse today. Here is a chart from Facebook specifically detailing how many fake accounts they have to deal with on a regular basis. And in just the last six months, there were more than three billion fake accounts that Facebook detected and was able to remove from their systems. Now, in the same report, Facebook also revealed that using machine learning to be able to identify these fake accounts had a 99.8% success rate. Now think about exactly what that means with a problem of this magnitude. It actually translates into more than 40 million accounts in that time period that they were not able to algorithmically detect. All it takes is a single account to upload a piece of fake content which then goes viral in order to be able to influence public opinion. Imagine what you could do if you had 40 million accounts to be able to do that. And there is a huge marketplace for these fake accounts. This is really the basis for being able to propagate disinformation online. Here's a snapshot of one of these marketplaces that sells not only Facebook fake accounts, but also Twitter fake accounts, Reddit fake accounts, and uh, fake accounts for other platforms. You'll notice some terminology here that's worth uh, spending a minute on. Soft reg accounts are accounts that have simply been registered, often using automated scripts, and they don't necessarily have any friends that are associated with them on the platform. They don't have a great deal of activity. And so those accounts might actually stand out and look suspicious to something like Facebook's uh, detection algorithms. A boosted account, on the other hand, is an account that might have a few friends that the cyber criminal organization that registered the accounts has uh, associated with it. It might have some activity, it might have a little bit of a history, it might even be manually registered. And aged accounts are the accounts that have actually existed on the platform for quite some time. These are accounts that look organic. They might have not only hundreds of friends that they're connected to, but they might have had conversations with these friends that the cyber criminals have simulated over the course of months or even years so that they look like they're behaving exactly the same way that a legitimate user on Facebook or on Twitter would look. So these aged accounts are really difficult to detect. And in general, they sell for much higher rates than the boosted accounts or the soft reg accounts. So what attackers are doing in these cases is they're using automation to be able to pass what you can think of as a mass Turing test. So the most widely used Turing test in the world uh, is designed to be able to keep this type of automated activity out and to allow humans in. And that system is CAPTCHA. So CAPTCHA, not a lot of people realize this, actually stands for completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. And so the intent here is create something that's easy for humans and hard for bots. Google did some research into this, specifically into synthetic distorted text challenges that their own reCAPTCHA system was using, and they wanted to validate whether or not CAPTCHA was fulfilling its mission. And what they discovered, unfortunately, was that humans had become terrible at solving CAPTCHAs, getting them wrong most of the time, and bots, on the other hand, using machine learning-based optical character recognition, now had a 99.8% solve rate. 
There are also cyber criminal services that will outsource CAPTCHA solving to sweatshops in order to be able to solve any new CAPTCHA system which is created. So you've all heard about massive data breaches that have occurred over the course of the last several years. And all of the usernames and passwords that are in that ecosystem are used by another set of cyber criminal tools like this one, which is called Sentry MBA, in order to automatically log into every account system that's out there. And this is what we do at Shape. We identify this type of activity and we protect the online banks, the online airlines, and all of the other online services that are subjected to it on a daily basis. So how frequently do these attacks occur? Because remember, it's a lot more valuable to be able to access an aged account, particularly an account which is owned by someone else. If you can take over those accounts using a real username and password, because users rampantly reuse the same password across various sites, now all of a sudden, you've got a very trusted account on a system because it belonged to a real user. So when you look at any major online service, this is what normal traffic looks like. You expect to see this diurnal periodicity when it comes to the organic traffic where your real users are going to be using your service more frequently during the daytime than during the night. And this is actually a snapshot of traffic from one of the world's largest retailers. So this is what it should look like, but this is what it actually looked like during the time period that we were analyzing it. This looks a lot more random, and there's a reason for this. The organic traffic pattern only represented about 8% of the traffic. The vast majority of the traffic on a 24-7 basis was actually coming from credential stuffing attacks that were trying to take over these accounts by simulating human logins. And this is a pattern that we see across every major online service all around the world. So whether it's top luxury retailers or European airlines or hotel chains or social networks, this is what is happening regardless of whether or not people have visibility into it and whether or not the online services have visibility into it. So as we're thinking about the impact of how they can use these accounts and how disinformation can get propagated and particularly how deep fakes are going to get propagated in the coming years, one of the things that I want to leave you with is a framework for thinking about this evolution. So, we're sort of between stage one and stage two right now. Right now, uh, an individual who has access to the technology, who has the right skill set, can create a pretty convincing deep fake. We're not quite at stage two yet, where there are millions of people and sufficiently commoditized tools that anyone will be able to create a deep fake of their own. And we have some time before we're at stage three where an individual or a single group is going to be able to mass produce this content. There's still some cost that's associated with that and some time to be able to do the uh, an analysis and rendering to be able to create the deep fakes. So an illustration of this is a journalist at The Verge actually got fake app and was trying to create deep fakes himself and what he discovered was that he was really bad at it. So there is a little bit of a learning curve that still exists to be able to create these deep fakes, but that's something that's rapidly being closed. So what I want to leave you with is what we can really do about this problem. We have to constantly be skeptical of information that we receive. We need to verify sources and we need to do everything that we can as individuals and as platforms to be able to proactively detect fraud. As Thomas Jefferson said, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And if you were eternally vigilant and you were skeptical and you verified sources, you would discover that Thomas Jefferson never actually said this. <laughs> it was actually from an Irish politician named John Philpot Curran, and the quote that he gave was less catchy, and that's probably why the disinformation is what has, what has persisted and has been commoditized and commercialized over time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that keynote. That was very entertaining as well. <laughs> um, so, um, hello, my name is Josephine Pung and um, I'll be moderating today. Um, so, just a little bit about me. I'm an AI policy researcher at the Future Society. I have a background in Chinese and law and my experience is in uh, policy creation and legal reformation pertaining to human rights violations. 
Um, and I'm, I'll be pivoting to become a barrister working on human rights and um, artificial intelligence. But today, uh, we are joined by four amazing uh, panelists. Um, so just to add on to the introduction that was given for you, uh, Schumann. So um, he leads the uh, product engineering and research um, as the chief technology officer at SHAPE. Um, so SHAPE's AI platform defends the world's largest banks, airlines, and retailers uh, against sophisticated cyber attacks. Um, SHAPE um, was ranked by Deloitte as the number one fastest growing company in California and named by Fortune as one of the leading AI companies. Um, Schumann previously led uh, global product management for click at Google, which was also mentioned. Uh, one of the largest scale using um, uh, machine learning and uh, also helped uh, to launch Gmail. Um, and he was also named as the, one of the top innovators in uh, the history of, of MIT. Um, so we're also joined by Giorgio Petrini. Um, so he is CEO and chief scientist at DeepTrace, an Amsterdam-based uh, cybersecurity startup developing deep learning technology for detecting synthetic videos. Um, so previously he was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Amsterdam working on deep uh, generative models in Max Welling Group, and earlier at uh, CSIRO Data 61 in Sydney, Australia, building privacy, uh, preserving distributed uh, learning systems. He um, also has a PhD in uh, machine learning at the Australian National uh, University, and also co-founded Why Not, which, was, um, which is an online mobility startup acquired by um, lastminute.com. Over here, we have Laura Ellis, um, who um, has, is an experienced digital leader um, and journalist with focus on emerging technologies, machine learning, data ethics, and content integrity. She, had, um, she has led BBC News teams across broadcast and digital outputs for 20 years and has a strong track record in successfully delivering creative multimedia content to mass audiences. Um, as a presenter, reporter, mm. producer, and editor, she has worked all over the world and across the UK, and now at, is um, at the forefront of the digital media innovation, and she works with teams across the BBC and beyond on challenges of deploying uh, new emerging technologies. And then finally, we have um, Philip Howard, um, the director of uh, the Oxford Internet Institute, professor of sociology and international affairs. He investigates the impact of digital media on po political life around the world, and he is a frequent commentator on the global media and political affairs, on global media and, com and, and political affairs. Um, particularly focuses on the impact of um, information technologies on democracy and social inequality. Um, ex he also explores how information technologies are used in both civic engagement and social control in countries. So a very um, impressive panel with a very long bio. Um, <laughs> um, so I'd like to open up the, the discussion with um, a, a very general question, almost philosophical. Um, and I, was, I actually wanted to link it to your quote with Churchill, which was, um, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to get its pants on, but it's a lie, it's not true. Um, so to do the question, so there's a, there's a, given the rise of artificial intelligence and, the automation, and automation technologies, we are seeing an increase in the manipulation of uh, information, which could have a detrimental effect on society. So do you think we live in a world where we can no longer trust our eyes and ears? So could we start with, oh, well, actually, you've given us a, an amazing keynote. So let's start with you, Georgia. Sure. Hi, everyone, and thanks for having me. Um, on the question of believing, uh, I think uh, even more if you focus on uh, audiovisual media, I think today we are really on the verge on the problem that we should start stopping believing anything that we see and we hear if it is in digital media. And I would actually go beyond this, saying that we probably believe uh, in all video media before today for all the wrong reasons. Because if you ask yourself uh, why today, or maybe yesterday, uh, since we know now, uh, it's not the time anymore to believe anything in a, in a video. Why today we believe a, that a video would carry uh, truth and factual evidence of something that actually happened before, 
was really for one reason, and that's the wrong reason. The reason was, until today, there was no technology readily available for us as a commodity in a way, for manipulating the meaning on videos and conveying completely different information that the videos uh, would have given if they were real recording of reality. So just uh, the lack of technology was what until today make us believing in videos. And uh, I think today we are in front uh, of the time, maybe we are the generation in uh, human history that finally need to come to, um, to term to the fact that uh, we need to move forward and uh, start to train ourselves and the next generation to stop believing in what we see just because it is digitally recorded. Thank you for that. Um, could you take the question, please? Certainly. I uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. I would have to say that it's. I, I don't think we should stop trusting. Right? Trust is pretty foundational to society, and things would fall apart if we suddenly started uh, mistrusting everything. I think to direct uh, d direct um, our attention, perhaps it's mostly about trusting the platforms to present useful information or trusting our governments to regulate. Uh, I, for one, think we're, we're past the point of industry self-regulation. And the idea that everyone should just be smarter about consuming media is, is, is inane. It's, it's not going to work. Um, most people, most of the time, don't think about politics. But they do in those three days before they vote. And that's, that's when they need high quality information. If social media platforms can't deliver it, and governments won't help provide the guidelines for a free and fair election, then it's, it's probably the trust issue is between those institutions. The technology itself is pretty neutral. Um, it's sometimes cyber criminals that, that manipulate the technology in cruel ways. Um, but I'd also want to emphasize that it's actually not cyber criminals that do the most politically poisonous stuff. It's, it's homegrown white supremacists. It's um, sexist and racist propaganda sources that are in country. It's paid lobbyists that are in our countries. It's not cyber criminals. It's, it's our existing political, it's a political structure that produces these things. Thank you. Actually, could you, sorry, before going on to you, um, could you actually um, talk a little bit more about um, the implications of the people that actually use the technologies in order to, I guess, build inequality, I guess, in, in terms of, you know, you were saying that it's actually built by white supremacists, you know, people actually using these technologies um, in that sort of way. So could you talk a little bit about that, please? So the best examples, the, the ones I feel most comfortable about are the ones that are historical. I'd rather speak with the cases we know okay. about than go too far in the future. But the, our team at Oxford was the team that caught the volume of misinformation about Brexit and over the U.S. over uh, during the U.S. elections, we know the security services had access to closed data. It was our team at Oxford that that caught the large volumes of misinformation um, during those major political events, and it was often political figures that were spending significant amounts of money on consultants who were in country, or perhaps in Poland, or perhaps in Russia. Uh, and these budgets were going to significant organizations with um, phones and desks and offices and health benefits and retirement plans. This is not about lone hackers causing trouble. This is about a formal advertising industry that takes advantage of the platforms uh, but hasn't yet, hasn't yet been choked off by those platforms. I see. Okay, thank you. Um, and you, do you want me to repeat the question? No, no. you're fine. I, I think, you know, this is all just so interesting because uh, do we have any journalists in the room? Yep. Okay, so <laughs> how horrifying is it, you know, that we're in this new era now? We're actually in a, in a completely new place to, to when I started in journalism, which is that text could always be falsified. We knew how to spot that. We knew how it happened. But I think there's something particularly horrifying about seeing video and hearing audio that has been changed. And I remember my horror when I first came across a piece of content that was uh, ostensibly from my teams, which was falsified. And you just think, no, this can't be real. So uh, as a journalist, there's nothing more horrific than the thought that somebody is going to not trust you because um, of, of, of something else that's happened or because um, of a view that this content might be false. So um, what I think we're, we're in now is, is a new era where we have to start to learn um, both as a society how to ask those questions but as journalists, uh, to, to work out how to help people to come to the right conclusions about 
the stuff that we're putting out. And that's something I, I guess we'll go into in a little while, but there are lots of ways you can do that. But what you can't do anything about, and I think this is the most horrific thing about, of, of it all, is that some people genuinely don't want to do that. So some of the research that we've done in, in the BBC um, and elsewhere, I mean, there's an awful lot of other research that backs this up, but I can only speak for the, for the stuff that we've been involved with. Um, it, it shows that there is actually a, a pleasure that people take in, in, in sharing fake news, even when they know it to be fake. And I hate that term, but it, it's just a kind of a, a shorthand. Uh, and I think, you know, d dealing with the psychology behind that, dealing with, you know, making sure that people have good signals and dealing with um, this, this very, very new universe that we're finding ourselves in is going to be really challenging. Thank you. Um, so my next question is actually directed at um, Philip. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about your research at the Computational Propaganda Project. So you know, it focuses on the investigation of interactions of uh, the algorithms, um, automation, and politics. So um, I just wanted to know a little bit more about how, how this affects society today and you know, the politics of today. It's, it's really tough for us to associate the impact of a tweet on a vote that we don't really have the models for understanding how a particular post might shape a particular political outcome. Um, but we can say some things about the long-term trends, right? You can still measure the number of in UK voters who think that the 350, 320 million pounds will be saved for the NHS each week. That's, that's still a measurable number, even though the sources of the campaign claim have retracted and admitted it's not true. You can still measure the number of young people, young voters in the US, who think that Hillary Clinton was involved in something in that pizzeria, that there was something going on, they're not quite sure, that those levels of doubt are actually long tail effects. So any particular story doesn't get shared very much. We, we believe that it tends to travel farthest on the far right, and that the far right tends to generate more. The far left generates some, but it's, it's usually ultra-conservatives that produce most of the misinformation for an audience of other ultra-conservatives. Um, there's some variation across countries, but that's broadly what the audience for this stuff is. The, the general public is not the audience for, for this kind of misinformation. Could you tell us a little bit more about how this varies across countries? Yes. Um, one of the things that seems to hold across countries is that if your country has a public broadcaster, not, not a broadcaster that's owned by the government necessarily, but some kind of public broadcaster that maintains a culture of professional journalism, then there's more independent media outlets that maintain that, those values of professional journalism. The countries that have very weak broadcasters or the public broadcaster is actually owned by the political party, right, or there isn't one at all, those are the countries that don't seem to have the inoculation against fake news. Okay. Um, so Philip touched upon um, some of the methods that you know, are used for disinformation, but I would like to move on to deep fake videos. So you have a lot of um, experience and a substantial experience, especially with your work at you know, Deep Trace and your PhD, et cetera. Um, so could you tell us a little bit more about you know, your current experience with deep uh, fake videos and how you think um, about the implications uh, on society? Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I guess bottom line to start with uh, our our team uh, at DeepTrace, uh, part of the activity that we do except building technologies to detect and understand fake videos, it's really go on the internet and uh, have a full understanding and scoping the phenomenon of deepfakes as a societal problem essentially. So we will go to look where, what are the tools that are available, uh, who is using them, uh, what is their incidence in different parts of the internet. And uh, actually connecting back to your talk, Schumann, I really like that uh, you mentioned the word uh, commodity, commoditization, because that's also what we like to talk about this year. Uh, in contrast maybe with um, um, sometimes people talk about the democratization of AI, I feel maybe it doesn't really apply here since we are really giving tools away for also for potentially doing ARM, um, open sourcing them. So um, if you go to the raw number, uh, our proprietary research has uh, shown, uh, I think this is a stats from last month, uh, uh, we found on the internet up to 12,000 synthetic videos already. Uh, those are in many different places. If you want to ask me where mostly, this is still about mostly the realm of uh, uh, fake pornography, about 95% of this. 
Um, how did we get here uh, is because uh, some of these tools uh, are becoming very easy to use. Uh, first of all, for technical people that understand uh, uh, a little bit of programming, uh, not necessarily deep learning researchers, that's not the people that they're talking to, uh, they're talking about anymore, that might be what was happening five years ago. Today, even if we give these tools that are open source library on GitHub, very well documented uh, with very good tutorials, you can ask question, technical question to people that are developing them. If you give these question, if you give these tools to an undergrad student in computer science, they will be able to create uh, some okay, convincing uh, uh, face as well, for example, over video, over a week of work projects with a budget of uh, f 50 bucks over AWS. That's kind of the bar that is shrinking and is going down. Uh, but also, uh, as you mentioned in your talk, uh, the, those tools are becoming also available for non-technical audience in a way. Um, graphical interfaces, also we see marketplaces opening, uh, so even business models built around the idea that you can create fake videos and fake audio. We see people um, uh, building up their own website where you can uh, ask uh, a deep learning, uh, sorry, a, a deep fake for, as a service. You will send them video, you tell them uh, what you want to achieve, uh, and in a couple of, in couple of days of work, uh, you will pay them, and then you get your video and you can upload it, whatever it is. Uh, same with voices, we've seen people on uh, Fiverr, uh, for example, saying uh, uh, we can produce a Trump voice, 50 words per $10. That's already like uh, setting the prices on the market. Um, those are all um, data points that are telling us uh, in the last couple of years, this technology are really becoming available to many. Uh, quality is improving, um, cost is shrinking. Um, then if the question is, uh, um, okay, we are seeing uh, the numbers, the quantity, but can we really pinpoint it to some uh, particular case of uh, uh, implication in society or in politics or in the news ecosystem? Um, actually, yes, yeah, so something is already, um, is, is already happening uh, very important uh, that maybe not many people are aware of. So maybe I, I want to tell you a little bit about a story that we've been involved uh, in particular with, uh, with Deep Trace. Um, this was uh, about an investigation uh, by journalists from uh, Mother Jones a magazine in the US. And uh, that's a case um, that happened at the end of last year. Uh, the background is uh, in uh, Gabon, uh, in Africa, uh, the president, the head of state, uh, Ali Bongo was missing from the public scene uh, for several months. And uh, the opposition party as well as the public opinion started to question uh, uh, his health, um, essentially asking him, is the president alive? Is the government still in charge? We need proof because he, the, the president hasn't appeared in a long time. Uh, as response, the government published a video uh, as a new New Year statement of the president, a very short clip uh, um, essentially oddly looking in the sense that the, the, the president didn't speak for very long, didn't appear uh, as normal uh, and the way he speaks and, and uh, he talks to people. Also his eyes were uh, oddly looking, one of his arms was completely still. And uh, essentially over Facebook and over social media, people started to say, hey, this is a deep fake, uh, we don't believe this, give us the real thing or it's time for election. Uh, and dramatically, just seven days later, a militia group started to occupy uh, governmental buildings in the country, also citing the oddness of the video as a motive of the military action. Um, so bottom line, uh, um, at the end of the day, still today, uh, the president is in charge, the coup was only attempted, it was successful. It turned out, uh, um, also supported by our opinion and some other experts in the US, this was not a case of a defake. But this is a very important lesson that we have here, I think. Uh, just because it is possible that people will make a defake has already had uh, very important historical consequences in a country that maybe doesn't have very strong uh, um, democratic uh, institutions to support the whole ecosystem, but still it has a very important potentially catastrophic effect and potentially um, having a violence erupting in the country. So um, we are already there, and uh, unfortunately, the tools are already there to make people doubt of uh, truthfulness in what we see, and so we should be prepared. Thank you. Um, so this is actually a really good segue into the next question that I have for you, Laura. So, you know, the technologies that are used for disinformation seems to be easily accessible and can actually have huge implications even today. 
Um, so I wanted to ask you, you know, how, how do we flag and annotate these problematic contents on, on different platforms and, you know, what sort of, um, how can we verify the authenticity of this information? So I think there's some, there's some fascinating um, lessons coming out already around how you flag content and what effect that has. Um, I think one of the things that would be really helpful if we could do um, as, 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 a, as a group of journalists and as, as the platforms and the technologists working together would be to agree some kind of taxonomy. So to go back to your example, Shimon, of the Nancy Pelosi video, which is such a great example, you know, should we have had something on that that said, this has been manipulated and this is how? Um, because, you know, then at least you have a chance of, of, of really showing the people that don't read beyond the headlines, and there are a lot of them, that, you know, this is something perhaps to be nervous of. So can we agree a taxonomy? Could we find a way to flag um, that material which is helpful to the audience? We do know that sometimes, or I think we know, some research has shown, and this is disputed, that um, if you put, this is fake news, people will go, oh, great, okay, fine, that's interesting, I'll look at it anyway. Um, so are we helping ourselves? Does it have to be more subtle than that and a bit more uh, nuanced? So, so what's the taxonomy? And then, again, I think, how can we work together as, a, as an ecosystem on this? Um, the people who are doing the academic research, the journalists, the platforms, the technologists, the CSOs, how do we band together to say, is there more that we can do to share what we're doing, to share those terrible moments when the, the video that Georgia just described, you know, it c comes up, and um, we need to do something about it. Uh, you know, I think as media organizations, we're traditionally very competitive, but in this area, there's no sense that we want to be the ones that are laughing at, you know, somebody else for having fallen for, for a, um, a piece of news that, it, that isn't correct. So I think there is probably the potential to have quite a, a well-developed ecosystem of sharing research, sharing um, observations, and sharing those, those really key moments when perhaps the threat is that it's most, um, it's most serious, and around elections, as, as you say, Philip. So. Thank you. Um, so I have another question for you, uh, Schumann, um, which is, you know, what, what is the advice, um, what is your advice on how to approach security and um, defending services that are available to the public? So you are, you know, your, your company um, basically um, does cybersecurity for, for big, you know, banks, for example, and you were talking about, like, how um, there are different technologies that are able to take on, you know, um, you, you know, formulate, you know, profiles, etc. So I was just wondering what, what's the sort of work that you do um, at SHAPE that can, um, you know, defend their services, basically? So it's really about the proactive detection of any type of attack, fraud, or uh, propagation of disinformation that might be entering your system. So I think that in the case of banks, it's primarily fraudulent transactions and fraudulent uh, attempts to log in to take over accounts that we're detecting. But when we're talking about social networks that we protect, that's a good example where uh, any action which can be automated, like posting uh, an image or posting a video or connecting with a friend, that uh, amplifies the effect of the fraudster or whoever is trying to create harm. And so uh, all of these services are trying to figure out how can we use technology and people to be able to detect this activity as quickly as possible and take appropriate actions. And so uh, I think that uh, one of the challenges is that uh, every platform can be attacked this way. There isn't necessarily the incentive to do that. The reason that the largest social networks are attacked more frequently than smaller social networks is because that's where the real users are. are. So if you want to try and get uh, a deep fake in front of millions of people, you're going to go to Facebook and you're going to go to Twitter and uh, other large social networks first. Of course, you're probably going to put the content up on Google and through other channels as well, and that's where automation plays a role. So if you're an individual and you're trying to take your deep fake and put it in front of as many people as possible, that's a lot of hard work. So you create scripts to be able to automate that. And what we do and what you know, all organizations are, are trying to figure out now is how do you detect that automation? And so I think that AI in general is a great example of this. So we're at an AI conference and uh, you know, we're talking about how AI is a fundamentally different paradigm than the technology that preceded it. In a lot of ways, I think it's a natural evolution of that same technology. I think that now we have 
computing power and we have data that we didn't have in earlier eras. But uh, the way that we're using that technology is very similar. We're trying to make things that were previously manual and person intensive uh, automated and easy to be able to do. And so, uh, like Georgia was mentioning before, when it comes to deep fakes, I think that the challenge is that um, they are moving in a direction where anyone is going to be able to generate this content at a very large scale, quickly. So at uh, one point uh, about you know, 15 years ago, when we were all drowning in email spam, about 90% of the world's email spam was actually coming from about three sources. So that's the impact of automation, and we see this in every single area. So then what are your concerns for the future? What are the, you know, the evolution of, of you know, disinformation will probably be, you know, impact society even more so? Um, and I'd like to ask you, like, how would um, social media, how do we hold social media companies accountable? Um, and what sort of work should they be doing right now and to move forward and think about the future implications of these technologies? Well, I want to um, uh, echo something that Philip mentioned before. I don't think that uh, the solution uh, is for everyone to just behave differently and get smarter overnight. I think that uh, over time, everyone is going to get more skeptical and is going to be verifying sources like I was mentioning. But what if that takes 50 years? What, what if that takes like massive generational change and appreciation for the implications of technology that simply doesn't exist right now? What do we do in the interim? And so I think that the social networks and the media are all figuring this out. We, we could have technology using, you know, Giorgio's technology, for example, to be able to flag whether or not something is a deep fake, and that could be part of the mechanism that's used by social networks to be able to detect this content. But then there's a question of how do you alert users? How do you have that conversation? And we as a society still haven't figured out what to put on a pack of cigarettes to get people to stop smoking them. So I think that uh, technology is a lot more complex, and the other difficulty is that it's constantly changing. Um, so I, I have a question for you, Laura, which is, um, so it seems like, you know, hu we humans are very um, easy and quick to believe um, information that originates from reliable sources. Um, how should we work with audiences to prevent disinformation? And um, how might we create a wider infrastructure for communicating around deepfakes and disinformation? So, so I think this builds on, on what Shimon's been saying. In, in terms of... Um, we need to provide people with tools. We need to provide people with tools if we can. So, you know, one thing that you could look at is, uh, is there a way we could do end-to-end -end verification? There's lots of companies that are already looking at this. There's lots of, of organizations that have started to use it. But, you know, could you find ways as a, as a trusted, I hope, you know, journalism organization to say, we're going to attach the metadata to what we do to, to make it both readable by machine and readable by human with some help? Uh, to show that this piece of material has or has not been manipulated. So uh, it feels sad that we have to do that, but I think we do. I think we, start to have to, we have to start to look at those sort of tools. I think secondly, um, I, and I think the social platforms come in for a lot of stick, and, I, and, and some of that's fair. And I think some of it isn't, because journalism also needs to look at itself. You know, are we, without enough critical look at things, sometimes too, too quick to publish stuff about disinformation without having a story around it. It's very easy to p publish the Pelosi video. Is that right? Should we be a bit more critical of ourselves? Should we have different guidance about when we publish something and what context we put around it? So I think we, you know, we need to put our hands up to that as well. It's very easy to criticize the social networks. And I think finally, there's some fascinating stuff that I've seen around how we get the next generation. So if we're the generation this has hit, how do we start the next generation off in a better way? And uh, you use the word, I think, inoculation. Um, there's some fantastic stuff around how you inoculate the generation that's growing up now so that they're a bit more savvy about it and so that they have an instinct to question. Whether they then choose to propagate that, that particular piece of disinformation, fine. But at least to have had the opportunity to, to have those mental pathways where they criticize and they critically appraise whatever they're seeing um, is, is something which is being tried out in a number of places and seems to be having some, some, some quite good effects. So I'm quite hopeful from that point of view. Great, thank you very much. Um, just to close, I don't know whether we have uh, enough time for one more. 
Two minutes, thank you. Um, so just to close the panel and to summarize the discussion, so I, maybe, you know, could you say a few words on, you know, maybe a call to, call to action? So, you know, what is missing from, from the framework that we have right now to deal with these challenges and, you know, what should be done? Who are the people that should be acting? And probably we can start with you, Laura. Okay, um, so I think um, question everything. Um, demand the tools to, to help you do that and, and you know, look out for those as they, as they start to become available. If you've got children, talk to them about it. Um, and give us a hard time. You know, if you have people in the media that you think are, are not behaving responsibly, call us to account. I think that's going to be such an important part of the discussion in the next little while. I think each country's election commission should have its, its writ expanded to include uh, some behavioral guidelines for political parties and the campaign consultants who actually put the big money into buying the, the tools for wide-scale manipulation. That's a, a, the election, Elections Commission should, should grow in capacity and strength. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so I, I follow that. Um, oh. So, yeah, I definitely agree. I echo that. Um, I, I think uh, action should be stronger from government in terms of uh, publicizing campaign about this topic, both at school level, but not just. So also for somebody like us, we cannot just think about the next generation as it has been said by Laura before. Uh, as well as uh, if we see so much investment in R&D from corporation and companies into synthesis, because it is easy to imagine business model around them, uh, we haven't seen so much in terms of uh, detecting uh, and authenticating tools. I, have, I hope that uh, the government can help there. Uh, I would just summarize it by saying um, arm yourself with knowledge, take responsibility for protecting yourself and the institutions that you care about against disinformation and hold other organizations accountable for identifying disinformation and protecting their users against it. Thank you very much. Um, please well, um, give them an applause and thank them, thank them, thank you very much.